So let's look at that. All right, so we wrote decimal to octal, decimal to binary, des or octal to decimal. So were you supposed to write decimal to hex and then also hex to decimal, both of them? Yes. Okay. Without using the integer. Oh, okay, gotcha. So we're going to... All right, so to convert decimal to hex, we're going to divide by 16 over and over and over again, but we're going to map 10 to an A, 11 to a B, so on and so forth, right? <clears throat> so we're going to basically take our same code we had for decimal to octal, except instead of modding by 8, we're modding by 16. But we won't just immediately put that answer on there. We need to make sure that our current number, mod 16, gets mapped to the letter A through F if necessary. Okay? So we can do this a couple of different ways. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and just write a quick little function. Uh, let's maybe not map digit map map num to char so if num is less than 10 what do we want to do the number by itself is fine correct So if I have the number one, and this guy is supposed to return the char one, how would I do that? We're going to do a brute force way, and then we'll do a, you know, a little bit nicer way of doing this. So what was passed in for num, as an example, num might be equal to the number one. If that's the case, I need to return the char one. So I can have put a bunch of if statements, right? I can say if num is equal to zero, return zero, else if num is equal to one, return one, so on and so forth. Okay, we can certainly, if, if num is equal to 10, return A, 11, return uh, B, so on and so forth. All right. But we really only want to have to do this for the things greater than or equal to 10. So we'll still leave a little hard coding in here for now. Fifteen is the largest remainder we would have in base sixteen, correct? Zero to sixteen minus one. 
Okay. So this is what will return if num is 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, or 15. <coughs> If num is less than 10, <coughs> I want to return the character version of that number. How would I do that? Go ahead. Add num to an empty string. Okay, we can add num to the empty string. So we can take the empty string, concatenate it onto num. That gets us a string. What do we want to do with that string? But I want to return a char. So if num was 1, that would have just given me the string 1, as opposed to the char 1. Mm, yeah, I can't, can't build an empty char. We do know how to convert an int into a, or a string into an int, don't we? Couldn't we say integer dot parse int? That? Well, that gets us a one out of there, right? So I can go from a string representation of a number back to an integer representation of a number. But how can we get a char representation? Char dot parse char. I don't think there is. If I'm looking at the string that, and I want to ultimately get that out of it, how do I get that? If I look at the string one, and I want to get the character one out of that, how would I? How do I accomplish that? String dot char it. Yeah. So I return the empty string concatenated with num, which is a new string. Dot char at zero. That'll build the string one in this case, and then give me the character at bucket zero in that string. So that would be a shortcut way of doing it. Or you can just put a bunch of if statements. If it's one, return one. If it's two, return two. If it's three, return three. So on and so forth. Taking type pass char? Nope. Really? I don't think that works. If you typecast the number one to a char, you'll get the Unicode value of a one, not the did not not the value one. Mm, should not work. I'll test it here in a second. I'll just throw that in there so this guy stops complaining. I know. <laughs> you didn't have to say it like that. Well, I said it nicer the first time, and then you tried to say it was wrong. <laughs> well, <coughs> I'm never wrong. That one Ask my wife. <laughs> so what he was, it's actually an interesting lesson to look at. What he was suggesting is, well, if we have the number one, can't we just print out the char version of the number one? I'll just put parentheses around everything so it's very sure what we're trying to do. And this is going to give us It should have given us something. I would have expected that to give us something. Oh, it probably isn't a displayable. Um, it's because the Unicode value one. What is the Unicode value one? Here, let's, 
just look at 15. What is uh, A? Is it 33? I'll give this a question mark. Uh, exclamation point. <laughs> I'm always testing you. That was, the, that was today's quiz. Durr. Well, in any case, char of 1 will give us <coughs> the Unicode value that's associated with bucket 1, which this terminal doesn't know how to display. It's whatever the number 1 is in Unicode. But if I say give me the string well, here we'll just we'll just write the string one here real quick so there's the string one give me the char at bucket 0 that will give me the char one and then if you want to know what the unicode value of that we can typecast that to an end that's number 49 is the Unicode equivalent of the number one in the Unicode character set. Okay, so that's one way we can map it. Uh, the way I prefer to map is like that. This will give us the equivalent answer, assuming they put in a number between 0 and 15. If the number is 0, I'm going to say give me the character at position 0, which is the char 0. The character at position 1 is the char 1. Character at position 2 is the char 2. Character at position 3 is the char 3. Character at position 10 is the char A. That make sense? So this is a nice little mapping trick you can use. Okay, so back to decimal to hex. We're going to take this value, num mod 16, and we're going to say converter dot map that. So this will boil down to the correct char onto the answer. And now decimal to hex should work. Was it 2989 I think is my favorite? Decimal hex number, is that BAD? Okay, so that is the decimal to hex conversion. And then the other direction. <coughs> hex to decimal, it's going to take in a hex string as a parameter, oh we were having them uh, enter it in right, so here let me just steal this, so we can be consistent, I'll start with the code for my binary to decimal, Enter a hex number. So we'll enter it in. We'll start at the ones place. Remember, we go for uh, hex would be the ones place, the 16s place, 
the what is it, 256 place, so on and so forth. Keep multiplying by 16 each time. So instead of multiply by 2, we'll multiply by 16. Now, when we're looking at one of these characters, so we read it in here, please enter a hex number, we'll read it in right here, we'll initialize our place at the ones place, then it goes to the 16s, then the 256, and so on and so forth, what is it, 4096 next? 256 times 16? Woot. Then 16, 535. Oh, 65,000, 536. I actually knew that. That was just the whole thing that oh, was a sure. question mark. Well, I got the five. I did confuse the 535, 536, but the 16 thing was just nonsensical. That was the same thing as the exclamation point to the question mark conversion I did. Blame that on the illness. Because remember, I'm never wrong. They're just momentarily confused. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I'm just partially delirious. <clears throat> Have you guys had the new iced coffee in the... Have you had the iced coffee, though? They have new iced coffee in the cafeteria. It's good. This isn't it, by the way. But it is good. Uh, what was I doing? Oh, okay. So we'll start the play us off at one. Sum uh, we'll start the sum at zero. Now, when we were doing binary, we only needed to count the ones that had a one there. But for octal, we had to do all the ones between one and seven. Correct? Did we do a octal to uh, decimal? So here's the octal to decimal. Guts. So let's look at that. That was an upgraded version of our binary to decimal. Binary, we only cared when there was a one. One times anything was that anything. Otherwise, it would have been a zero for binary, right? Binary is base two, zero, and one. So zero times anything is zero. So if we we're adding zero times anything to a sum, it's gone because it's zero. So we'll put the octal code in here, and we'll doctor that up. Enter a hex number. We'll multiply it by 16 each time. And then what we did is we took the number at bucket I, and we converted it into an int. But we have a problem there. If I had entered in the hex number BAD, and I happen to be looking at whatever's at bucket zero, which is a B, and I tried to take the character B and I turned that into an int, what would you expect the result to be? What is the integer version of B? Well, since we're in hexadecimal thinking right now, we're gonna say, oh, that's an 11. But if we were still thinking in the decimal world, is there an integer equivalent to B? There's not, it doesn't make sense. So Java's gonna flip out right here. It's gonna say, whoa, 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 whoa. Number format exception. So let's go ahead and see that real quick. So we'll leave this in there for right now. We'll call our hexadecimal, and it will try to do all the right math, but as soon as I pass it something that is in, uh, uh, that has A through F in it, it's gonna flip out. Hex to decimal, please enter your hex number. So uh, we'll go ahead and do this for a nice, easy hex number, 128. Is that a legal hex number? Yep, it uses the digits 0 through 9 and A through F. So perfectly legal, and our code works just fine for this. There's 296. So code works, right? Done. Turn the homework in. But if I put in a more interesting hex number, like BAD, Number format exception. I have no idea how to convert a B into a number. 
So we're going to have to create that mapping for them. <coughs> Similarly, how we mapped a num to a char, we might want to write map char to num. And since we know we're just dealing with hexadecimal numbers and we can assume that the person gives us legal input, we can say, okay, well, if the input was the char one, I should return the int one. If the input was the char two, I should return the int two. If, the int, if it was the char <coughs> B, I should return the int 11, right? So we can write a whole bunch of if statements like that. So if val was equivalent to a zero, return the integer version of a zero. Else if val was equivalent to a one, return the int one, so on and so forth. Perfectly acceptable way of doing it. Just 15 times, all 16 times, I guess, zero through f. If it was equal to an a. Well, not everybody in here has had all the programming. So the solution for this homework was you only had to do it with the stuff we've learned in this class so far. So, could have just copied and pasted, copy and pasted, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth. When you get to, if it was an A, return a 10. If it was a B, return an 11. If it was a C, return a 12, so on and so forth. A nice little shortcut to this would be to create our string map again. And this makes the assumption that the person who enters in the hexadecimal number put it in an uppercase. So you can just convert it to uppercase. I can, but I just want to keep it as simple as possible. So we're going to assume in our little example here that the person using the program always puts stuff in in the correct format. So hex characters are in uppercase in our examples. Okay? So in any case, well, we can't trust anything you say now. You can't even convert a... I just... <laughs> Didn't you mess up the Hello World quiz too? <laughs> Multiple parts of it. Multiple parts. <laughs> He's one of my pet projects before he graduates. He's one of those programmers that actually knows a whole lot about it, but just can't get past himself to actually get to the point where he's good at it. We're working on it. Let's get there. It's going to be graduated, so it's going to look like what's going to him. Nah. He'll be good. He'll be good. It's kind of like a really great basketball player who just double dribbles a lot. They pay the refs enough, though. No one cares. Yes. That's true. He belongs in the NBA. That's that's the problem. <laughs> he would do just fine in industry, uh, which is probably actually a true statement. It's, that's why I like. That's why I don't like college basketball. It's too slow. What do you think? How many of you are college basketball fans over professional basketball fans? The rest of you are. Professional basketball fans or don't belong don't believe basketball should exist. One of the two. I don't think I think they should just be allowed to travel. Make like a hybrid between basketball and football. Just take dribbling out of it. We just assume dribbling, right? Like all these guys can dribble. Let's just make it full contact. That would actually be a that would be a pretty Wouldn't that be kind of a cool sport? Basketball mixed with football. They did that movie Basketball where they mixed <laughs> basketball with baseball. Yeah, now you put some tackling rules in there. Isn't that rugby though? Because you have to bounce the, the, the rugby ball every so often or something. Well, that's true. Yeah, see, rugby I think is a really hard sport. Yeah, those guys get messed up. Well, they don't. They don't wear pretty. They don't really wear legit pads either. Huh? 
I don't think there's that many injuries in it. I think those guys are really tough. Well, the, there are injuries. They just get up and walk away. It's like, <laughs> his entire leg's falling off. I'll, right. I'll walk it off. <laughs> He's going to be out for at least the remainder of the half. <laughs> <laughs> he literally had his leg ripped off. Comes out, he's got it duct taped on. <laughs> <coughs> duct tape and dental floss, he's good to go. Um, what was he doing? Oh, the map thing. Yeah, how did we get the severed legs from that? <laughs> Love it. See, that's the kind of stuff that would do great in these videos. Yeah. <coughs> Severed leg. <laughs> severed, severed, severed leg for the win. Um, wait, what am I doing? Oh, <laughs> I get very confused up here, people. Um, okay, so this guy's going to map a char to a number. So if I passed in the char B, I want this to ultimately spit out the number 11. Okay, so what we can do here. is go the other direction. There's a cool little function that everybody in here will know by uh, today. Well, everybody here now has heard it, but those of you who are currently in 250, you'll learn about this in a couple of weeks. <coughs> this is just the inverse of char at. So when I say give me the character at bucket zero, that'll go to bucket zero in this string and return the character that's there. Give me the character at position 10, That'll go to position 10 here and give you the character. Index of will find, if I say what is the index of A, it'll go and find A in here and its index is 10. It's at position 10. So it does a reverse of charat. It gives you the index of, a, of the first occurrence of a character in a string. Okay, so nice little convenience function there to make that shorter. But uh, 15 if statements, no big deal. So we'll come back down here, and instead of just tacking on the num at uh, dot char at i times the place, I need to actually get the numeric version of that. Okay, so I don't need to parse it. I'm going to steal this piece right here. I'm going to say converter dot map char to num. And the char I'm going to map is that char. So my string dot char at i is the character. I'll pass it in to map char to num. If it was the character 0, this guy will return the number 0. If it was the character 1, it will return the number 1. If it was the character a, it will return the number 10. So this will do the mapping for us. And then we'll multiply that by place and add it to our ongoing sum. Make sense? So now this guy works for BAD. Only capitals, though. Only capitals. So I guess deal. <laughs> All right, so questions about that. Um, now, so we were asking the question last class, why do we use hexadecimal? And uh, I think the patriarch told us something about memory. Something like that. Something like, something like that. Okay, what was, the, what was the point of memory? We decided that memory is really big. And it's divided up into a whole bunch of buckets. And in order to index it, we have to have enough numbers. And we need to reference those numbers in some sort of reasonable format. And we can pick, we can represent everything we're going to be talking about for the next uh, at least week is dealing with number representations. It's not that hexadecimal is better or worse than decimal is better or worse than binary. It all depends on how we represent it in a way that's the most convenient for the problem we're trying to solve. Okay, whether we're saying the number 2989 decimal or the number BAD in hex, that's the same number. We're just representing it in two different ways. Make sense? 
Okay, so an advantage of hex is that we can represent large values in small footprints. So for human beings, it almost exists as something that sits between binary and decimal. That doesn't make tons of sense because <coughs> hex is, all, all, is on the other end. But hexadecimal feels very foreign to us. But so does binary. right? Human beings don't work well with binary. But we also don't like gigantic numbers, even in decimal. As a number gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it gets more confusing for us. Single-digit numbers, we're good with those. Two-digit numbers, no big deal. Three-digit numbers, we're still fine. Four-digit numbers, we're good. Once you start getting to five-digit five digit numbers and bigger, now we start having to count the number of numbers to figure out, you know, is this thousands, 50, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, that kind of stuff. Um, we get less competent with those at a glance. Okay, so hex gives us a way of representing large values in small footprints. And I would say that's at least mostly true. Maybe even a more accurate way of saying it would have been um, we, rep we can represent large values in footprints that don't grow too quickly. Decimal numbers keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger significantly more quickly than hexadecimal numbers do. So it translates into small footprints. Okay, so let's talk about nibbles. I think before I was sick, I said we were going to talk about niblets. Did I say something like that? Okay, so we have a couple of, well, we have four different little phrases, I guess, words, that represent different chunks of values, typically binary. So a nibble is half a byte. It's a four-bit binary number. Well, what's a bit? A bit is either a one or a zero, right? Single binary digit. A nibble is four ones and zeros. A byte is eight ones and zeros. A word is 16 ones and zeros, or 16 bits. A double word is 32 bits. Okay, and actually we even go beyond that now since 64 bits is fairly common, but let's just leave it at this for right now. Nibbles are what's gonna be most important to us for the next little bit because we're going to write our converter a little differently here in a second. <coughs> okay, so we got these down. Nibble is 4 bits. Byte is 8 bits. We should have already known that. A word is a fancy way of saying 16 bits, and a double word is a fancy way of saying 32 bits. All right, so we got to go back. We were talking about periods and signals. We were talking about analog versus digital. What's the difference between analog and digital again? Go ahead. Uh, digital is either yes or no. And On or off, yes, no. A range. Okay. Analog has everything in between, right? So if we were to look at a graph of an analog value, it would look like a wave, right? We look at a graph of a digital value, it looked boxy. All right, so what if we need to represent analog values as binary numbers? So for instance, if temperature is a floating point value with no upper or lower limit, which I mean, since numbers keep counting up, I, mean, I know we, we, there technically is a absolute zero, right? When things just get bad. <laughs> but <laughs> right, right. But, but technically, I, I suppose the number could get lower than that. It would just we wouldn't be functional to measure it. Right? Yeah, it wouldn't make a difference. <laughs> but there's no upper or lower bound. What is it? Plus or minus two seventy three or something like that Celsius. I think that's it. I mean, see, that's in there from somewhere way back. It's zero Kelvin. Zero Kelvin. Zero, zero Kelvin is negative 273 Celsius, I believe. 
Huh? Zero Kelvin is zero. Zero Kelvin is no movement. Correct. But I mean, it's not that the numbers don't go lower than negative 273. It's that we can't measure them because we can't do anything. No, we just go back and It's a chicken or the egg problem. You go in negative Kelvin, you circle. Well, I mean, I don't think it's like, I don't really think it's debatable. I mean, we know for a fact that we can get to the number negative 274. That number exists. But we can't measure a temperature at negative 274 because at negative 273, we stop measuring. <laughs> we just stop. Because we can't do stuff. But the temperature can't get any lower. Well, how do you know? Because there's no movement. And what is heat? What is temperature? It's movement. So zero Kelvin is zero movement, which is no heat. I remember what so no heat. And then you start going back in time. I'm not sure if you can defend that part. <laughs> how, how can you not defend that part? If you have negative movement, then back in time. But you don't have negative movement. You just have no movement. At zero, you have no movement. At negative degrees Kelvin, you have negative. You have inverse. You have inverse movement. You have dark movement. Yeah. Go back, <laughs> back in time. Is an antimatter dark matter? Isn't that what they call it? So this is anti movement. Ha! Temperature can go below zero Kelvin. What? No, it's uh, can go below zero Kelvin and you have a broken thermometer. Well, you've broken everything at that point. But you wouldn't know if you had a broken thermometer because the thermometer is made of matter, and at that temperature, the could I don't think it can break. It's not like you can see it That's right, because your eyes would freeze. Well, they wouldn't be broken because they can't break. No light. The light wouldn't move. That's true. Man, we should just never let it get that cold. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Maybe what? Global warming wasn't a thing. Hey, the ozone <laughs> layer is up 4% since 2000 because of global warming. Yeah, because of greenhouse gases, yeah. the ozone layer is now getting better. So that's good. That's perfect. Yeah. Oh, so we're, we're, we're polluting, so we're getting a better ozone layer. Oh, see? Yeah. Hey, it's not one thing that kills us, it's something else. So don't pat yourself on the back yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <coughs> so, anyways, temperature is a floating point value with no upper or lower limit. Just saying. Okay, how can we represent this as an 8-bit binary value? So we would need to create a mapping between an arbitrary number of analog values, because there are, right, between 0 and 273, for example. You know, those, that's our range we're just going to use in this example. There is literally an infinite number of analog measurements, correct, with every little decimal place in the middle. But how many unique temperatures can we represent in 8 bits? Unique positive temperatures. Let's just assume we're representing a positive temperature for no good reason other than it keeps things simpler. So how many positive temperatures, unique, how many positive unique temperatures can we represent with an 8-bit number? Not, not rocket science. Well, that, close. Let's go one more multiple of two up. 256. It's 2 to the 8th power. There's 2 to the 8th unique numbers we can represent using an 8-bit number. Positive numbers. Or if we're going to go negative and positive, we can represent the numbers negative 128 to positive 127. Correct? Okay, um, well, that kind of puts a hamper on things. There's only 256 unique temperatures we can represent digitally with an 8-bit number. Yet how many unique temperatures are there analog in terms of analogly? analogly? What's, the, what's the equivalent of digitally in analog? Yeah, I, don't, I don't think that's right either. 
I'll think about that. That could be a quiz. Um, so we can represent an infinite number. There's an infinite number of analog temperatures, correct? But with an 8-bit number, we can only represent 256 unique temperatures. So if you were creating a system, a digital system for measuring temperature, what would you have to do? Because those things exist, right? Digital thermometers, they exist. What limitations do you put on temperature measurements? Okay, so the idea is that even though temperature can be anything, living in Wisconsin, what are what's our range of temperatures in a given year? Negative fifty to about forty. <laughs> <laughs> Closer than I actually should be. <laughs> so negative fifty to what, maybe one ten. We rarely get that high, but I mean that would be in the realm of possible. Here, I think since I've lived in I've lived in Wisconsin for eight years, I think I've seen like a 105 or six once. <coughs> so is negative 50 to 110 a reasonable range? Okay. So really, numbers less than that and numbers greater than that, we don't really need. At least, if it's if it's hotter than 110, we stop talking about it as a number. If it's colder than negative 50, we just say, don't go outside. <laughs> right? You know, so actually, I run into the problem more often on scales. <laughs> Anybody know what the maximum weight on a lot of digital scales is? Four, nine, nine, nine. Uh, for 400, you're, pay the, you're paying a premium for those. 330. Most digital scales, it's 330. Garbage. Just pop on one of those, it just immediately reads error. <laughs> then my wife makes fun of me. She says, error boy. <laughs> That's not very nice, is it? And then I get them, I go to the doctor, and they had, you know, they use the old the, the mechanical scales, right? You just get on that, they just put everything over to the side, just <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's not even close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those usually go up to 300 or 350. Yeah, they might have three. I think they're 300. Yeah, so they bottom out real quick. <coughs> I usually got to go to the doctor's office that has the truck scale. And get on one of those. Actually, I also found at the vet, the... Uh, oh, the little doggy scale? The dog scale that the, the dogs get on. Yeah, that works. That goes up higher. Isn't that stupid? Some way to measure that same charge. So every single time I go in to buy new cat food, I weigh myself. I go step on their dog scale. It's right next to the best friend's vet in uh, Grafton. It's right next to the desk. I can actually do my whole checkout process there, and they'll give me a little printout of my weight. A little smiley puppy next to it. What's up? The puppy's worth it. Seriously. Man, can you imagine somebody bringing in a dog that weighed that much? <laughs> <laughs> Last year, uh, the patriarch sent me a uh, a picture of a a dog. It was the, the the Russian Caucasian mountain dog. I wonder how much they weigh. I mean, I think they get up like two thirty. These big old dogs, like like a bear. That's my kind of dog. It was like that would like be like a normal sized dog for somebody my size. It's like my wife holds my big uh, my big cat. Gracie, and, you know, Gracie just looks gigantic. Well, Gracie just looks like a normal cat on me. I, don't, I just don't get it. This world's not fair. I'm surprised you don't have a main cat. Gracie's 25% lynx. They're, yeah, I, but the main cats are the ones that... The main coons. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, I know what you're talking they, about. They stretch up to like six feet or something. Yeah. yeah. They're just mean. They're mean cats, too. All those wild cats, they have really high predatory uh, instincts. It's ridiculous. So you just don't have I got, uh, I bought Gracie this uh, little, uh, from Doctor Who, a, a Dalek, uh, like, cat toy. 
when you push the button on it, it says, you know, exterminate or it says uh, uh, you would make a good Dalek. It ripped its face off. <laughs> No. She's a Star Wars fan? Huh? I guess she's a Star Wars fan. No, she likes Doctor Who. She just likes she likes ripping stuff apart. My kitty's lethal. Uh what was I talking about? Oh. Weighing yourself. Yeah, how scales aren't fair to fat people. That's right. Okay. So, anyways, when we get into the digital world, we have to often represent analog data as digital data. And that puts a limitation on us. Correct? I've done that before, too. You get two separate scales and you add the numbers together. Huh? Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to make sure. You can't do it on the digital scale because because uh, those just pick a number and you don't know if you have it right. You have to do two analog scales. It just get it so they're not moving, and then you add those two numbers together at your weight. Do you ever use the weight thing? Do you know what? I think I think has a maximum weight of probably, you know, 270 or something. I had somebody that went on and when I went on, it said, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> like it was like a joke put in there? It's like, whoa. Whoa. I wonder what it would say for me. <laughs> the screen just shuts off. Gives me a promo code to return the game. <laughs> Sorry, you're beyond hell. Just... Seriously. <laughs> Go back to Target. I snapped my Wii Fit board or whatever, <laughs> that, the balance board. <coughs> what happened? It's faulty. Okay. So we would have to pick some sort of way of mapping values between our minimum and maximum values we can digitally represent. So we need to map an analog value to an equivalent digital value. So you, rep you said maybe we go down to, for instance, with weight, maybe a half a pound, right? So we, if we say that people weigh between, um, we'll just go as low as zero. Okay, so we'll say the, a digital scale can represent weights of zero up to, let's say, 350 pounds. And we're going to do that in half pound increments, right? How big of a number would we need to hold that? How, how much binary data do we need to represent numbers between 0 and 350 in half pound increments? Okay, so we need 700 increments, right? We need to represent 700 unique values. Well. How big, of a, how big of a binary number do we need to represent 700 unique values? Three. Well, the biggest value, biggest positive value an 8-bit number can hold is 256. Yeah. Two to the nine. So 9-bit number? Two to the ninth gets us five twelve. Two to the tenth, thousand twenty four. So a ten bit, <coughs> ten bit number. What? That seems problematic. Well, our ten bit number is huge. Not a big deal. Our integers are typically 16-bit numbers, right? Okay. So, 10-bit number to represent a weight between 0 and 350 if we're going in half-pound increments. If we want to do quarter-pound increments, you go a little heavier. And then you get down to the actual measurement devices and how accurate they can be. You know, so there's a couple of different uh, uh, levels of things going on here. But in any case, um, we can create a linear function that maps between an actual analog value and a static binary value. So if we think about this, if you've had algebra before, this would be like a line, correct? 
So m is the rate of change in y, y-axis, with respect to change in x. That's slope. It's the slope of the line. b is the value of y when x is 0. This guy. And we'll see some examples of this. So we'll go back to our kitchen scale. Uh, that's why I kind of took us in the direction of a scale. This is a little bit different kind of scale. So we have m being our, we have range of analog values, all the different analog values we can have, divided by the number of intervals for binary integers. The okay, number of intervals we're going to have. So that is the max analog value minus the min analog value. So if we're going to, do, let's just use our example, and here we have uh, the range is, they, their scale is going to be 400 pounds. That one would work for me, by the way. I, I can, I, I get in under that. I'm about three, 346 or seven, something like that. Wait, most, of regular, regular scale, yeah. uh, mo most regular scales are 330. Well, it's 18 pounds. Well, that's true, but what's pretty close? Can't you just go scale and calibrate it? Like, 20 pounds flat, so it starts at negative 20. I don't think you can. Sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure some of these scales have like a limitation on like the way they measure people. The way they weigh you, yeah. I mean, it's, the mechanism is, isn't made for like boats and I'm stuff. I'm sure it's more than it lets you do. Well, uh, possibly. It's not that hard to find scales to go up to 400. You just have to specifically search for them. Usually, you have to order them on like Amazon or something. The, the fat people scales. They usually connect to apps too because they do all like body fat measurements and stuff like that. They don't, those don't work on me either. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's actually, that's a, uh, the last school I taught at uh, Western Illinois University. Uh, this was probably a, at least a decade ago, maybe 12 years ago. Um, another prof there, uh, Dr. Johnston, he, uh, him and I both taught the same uh, programming class. We just taught different sections of it and we actually shared assignments. So he, I would write one assignment, he'd write the other, we just alternate back and forth. And he wrote an assignment for them to do a, a BMA body mass index calculator. And uh, his assignment, the, uh, the, the requirements for the assignment didn't go big enough for, for my, I was off his, uh, off his scale, for, which I found very insulting. <laughs> no, it was funny. Um, okay. So in any case, if we have 400 pounds to zero pounds, that's the range, 400 pounds, and we're going to have 1,023 binary increments. So we're going to do this with a 9-bit number, or a 10-bit number, rather. Okay, so that's zero to 1,023. So 1,024 actual increments, which is, shouldn't this have been 1,024? Well, no, because you don't want to use zeros, whatever. That's fine. <coughs> so that gets us M of 0 0.391 pounds per binary increment. So the precision of this weight, precision of this, uh, this scale, when measured in binary, is down to 0 0.391 pounds. That's the smallest increment or decrement we can go. 0 0.391. Okay, so each time the binary number increments, so going from, this is a binary number to that same binary number with plus one on it, it represents an increment in the analog value of 0 0.391. Okay, that makes sense? So this is one way we can map analog values onto digital values, but we have lost precision, haven't we? But we might deem that that precision isn't necessary. So when we deal with a scale, and this kind of gets back to, this is, so this is related. So uh, our friend Nick over here, he has a very um, accurate scale, right? Um, so when you weigh stuff, 
For instance, a scale that only weighed within 0.391 pounds would not be acceptable for what you're doing. That would do you no good, right? You know, he, he's measuring very precise values. Um, so this type of uh, digital product would not be acceptable for what he's having to do. It'd have to be redesigned. Um, so that's something we do need to consider for the application we're using this thing for. Now, what I want to write here real quick is something that solves for M for us, because we're going to use this in uh, the next thing we're going to do. So we're going to go back to our converter. We're going to write a tool that's going to take in our high and low analog values and then the number of intervals that we want to have. Okay? And why don't we go ahead and do this as the size of the binary number? So we're going to take in three inputs. <coughs> so we'll go into our converter. We'll have it return a double. Um, for right now, we'll just call this solve for M. And we'll, we'll change it up later. And this guy is going to take in a double analog high, a double analog low, and an int binary digits. Okay? So we're going to take in those three pieces of information and we're going to solve for M like we've done in that we did in that previous slide. <coughs> so we're going to take the range of analog values that is high minus low. So double range of analog is equal to analog high minus analog low. So that gets us our top number. Bottom number is our number of intervals. So that's 2 to a power minus 1. So this is the number of binary digits we want. So it's going to be 2 to that power minus 1. Number of intervals is equal to math dot how to to binary digits minus one okay and then ultimately we'll solve for M by dividing those two so we'll return range of analog divided by number of intervals. Make sense? Okay, we'll go and test this. Solve for M, so we'll do analog high. We'll just test it against the numbers we had before. 400, analog low is zero. Binary digits, we're gonna say is 10. And we'll print out the result of that. And there's our 0 0.391. All right, so we wrote a little tool to solve for that part of this problem. So every single time we step up, we step by, up by 0 0.391. So 0, 0.391, then point uh, whatever it is, 782, 1.73, so on and so forth.
Another example they gave give here is about ovens. Does an oven really need to measure values, measure temperatures below 100 degrees? So in that case, maybe we go 600 to 100, and we represent this in 10 digits, or I'm sorry, nine digits. So we might say 600 to 100 over nine digits gets us 0 0.978. 0.978 degrees per binary increment. Okay, and the advantage of that is now we have more accurate measurement. <coughs> if we make that range go down up here. Okay, assume that the processor uh, monitoring the temperature of an oven with a temperature range of 100 to 600 degrees measures as, as a 9-bit binary value. <coughs> so something like this. What temperature does this represent? So what temperature does this binary number, 01100010, represent? Without even looking at the solution, uh, let me write down that number here real quick. Zero one one zero zero. I think that's it. Yep. Okay. So this is our binary number. We want to know what temperature that represents. Okay, this is the number of increments times whatever this guy solves for. Well, how many increments is this? It would be the decimal version of that, right? So we're going to do binary to decimal. So let's read that in first. And here's our value. I'll copy that real quick. So that's 202. Oh, I don't need that one up there anymore. So 197. So we have 202 degrees of increments. Each increment is worth that assuming that this problem uses the same breakdown. Oh, then plus 100, right? Because the base was 100. So we had 197, so it should actually be 297. Because the, the lowest to the, the oven can be is 100 degrees. So it's an offset off that. So we calculated that breakdown before. So we get our 202, converting it from binary to base 10. We already wrote the tool that did that, right? We all know how to do that by hand. All right, then we get our temperature, which is this range, that's our M, times 202 plus the 100 for our base, which gives us our final temperature. And then we can put that on the readout. So we're storing the value digitally in a binary value. But when we display it, we rarely will display stuff in binary, right? Because displaying is for human eyes. And humans want to see digital, decimal values. I'm sorry, they want to see decimal values, not digital values. So the value from the above example is slightly inaccurate. Uh, this value actually represents a range of values, blah, 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 um, with a lower limit of 297.65 degrees. Only a binary value with infinite number of bits would be entirely accurate. So again, this rehashes this idea that whenever we do something digitally, we're giving up some accuracy. But when we're cooking something in the oven, you're making a lasagna, 
Does it necessarily matter if you're measuring down to the fraction of one degree? When you're baking something, we usually bake something at a number of degrees, right? And actually, when we step up in degrees, how many of you ever read the directions on the back of a box that said, preheat the oven to 403 degrees? What are the, what are the typical increments? 25s? I think I maybe have seen 410 degrees before. So maybe we say it's a, a fair statement, it might be a 10 degree increment. But typically it's 300, 325, 350, 375. Usually 25s is safe, but I think I have seen like 410 before. Um, okay, so we do have to think about accuracy when we get into digital numbers. I'll skip past that. Actually, for the next one, we have to look at this one more closely. So we're talking about the resolution of this. So the resolution of this particular thing, which is the analog range divided by our value, we've been calling, this was what we solved for before, which was M, correct? This is the same, the same value. Now we're replacing M with resolution. So resolution gives us the idea of how accurate something is. Those increments. So assuming the analog range of a system using a 10-bit analog to digital converter goes from a lower limit of 5 ounces to an upper limit of 11 ounces, what is the resolution of the system? So again, it's 11 minus 5, which is 6. 6 divided by, we're going to do this with a 10-bit number. So that's 0 .005865 ounces per increment. So what we used to solve for M, we're now going to call resolution. Now where did M come from? M come, came from our linear function up above. We're going to bring all this back together here soon. Make sense? What time is this class out? 25? We have three minutes left? Okay. Okay, so this gets down to data representation. How many different increments? What's the resolution that we can represent our data in if we're representing it digitally using binary? Then we have to start dealing with sampling. Each time we sample a signal, so now we're going back to the idea of a digital signal. 2.4 gigahertz, that kind of stuff. Okay. So up to this point, we've been talking about how we're going to represent values. Now we're going to talk about how we're going to read values. Because how we represent values is only going to be as good as how accurate we are at reading them. So each time we sam sample a signal, we'll get a value. The more often we sample, the higher the sampling rate. Okay, makes sense. Higher frequencies require a higher sampling uh, rate, otherwise data is lost. It's called aliasing. <coughs> so let's say we're doing something at 2.4 gigahertz. So let's bounce back into our converter. Yeah, I'm going to put in a frequency. Please enter a frequency. I'll say 2.4. I'm going to say that's in gigahertz. Okay, so that's 4.16. <coughs> 10 to the negative 10. So what's the, uh, what's the measurement? of that in our milliseconds, picoseconds, nanoseconds? What was the one that was to the negative ninth? Negative ninth was nano. So this guy is 41.6 nanoseconds.
All right? Because I'm only going to negative 9. So this is 41.6 nanoseconds. So every 41.6 nanoseconds, whatever this piece of equipment that's transmitting at 2.4 gigahertz sends a signal. All right? Now, I'm going to read that signal once every five minutes. How accurate is my uh, reading going to be? Not at all. I'm missing huge, huge swaths of data because of how, how rarely I'm sampling that signal, correct? In order to keep up, how often do I need to sample it? At least as fast as it's giving me the data. But then we have this problem of what if they don't line up? What if I miss it just barely? That make sense? So we need to sample our input stream at at least the same rate, probably faster than it's being pulsed at in order to correctly capture our data. All right, so we'll pick up from there on, uh, let's see, Thursday, we'll pick up from there on Tuesday and deal more with sampling data so we can actually read stuff in. Get the slide set back to where we were. Okay.